All right, so uh, let's get started here. I want to I want to do uh, attendance code. Make sure you check in as usual. I want to review exam two, and then we'll talk about lab five, and then we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about the next uh, set of lectures. It'll be on the third exam. We'll take at the end of the semester. So here's the point spread. You all knew this last time. So let me, so I posted my solutions for the conceptual part of the assignment. So you've got those already. And the idea was that on Monday you were supposed to go through and send me an email if you wanted me to review any of the problems to see if maybe you maybe got the wrong number for some reason and you uh, showed on your uh, you showed on your hand calculations that you understood what needed to be done, but you just made some silly mistake. And so those were all work. There was eight questions, three points apiece, 24 points total. And so if you got the wrong number entered in uh, that quiz in Canvas, then you got zero points. And so the idea was on Monday you were supposed to send me uh, email requests, and I put instructions already on Canvas for that. So I extended the deadline until class started today. So any emails I've got before class started, I'll review those and award points uh, as applicable. So let me pull over the uh, Canvas quiz. And we'll go through these. This will be the last time these quiz these exams were taken. You know, the final exam is not. Uh, it's going to only cover the new information that we're going to talk about today to the end of the semester. So final exam is not cumulative. So this is the last chance I try to review this these topics. And I'm hoping that everybody learns all these topics. And so this is my last chance to make sure that's happened. So let's go through these one at a time. And if you got a question uh, about the solution, then stop me as we go. So somebody say hello and say you understand and let's go. I understand. I understand. Okay, good. All right. So this is the first set of questions that are worth 76 points total. Uh, so heat affected zone, that's the location where you got the base metal and the filler metal and everything is changing right there because it's where all the heat's applied. So that's the heat affected zone. Flux is the thing that outgasses from the clay material on the surface of the electrode. So there's several, uh, for stick welding is a good example, that clay material on the outside surface, when it gets hot when you're doing the welding, it outgasses, provides that cloud, the shield gas cloud around the weld. So that was flux. Inert gas does the same thing, but it's, uh, uh, it uh, provides prevention for oxidation and the MIG welding process is where that's used because metal inert gas, that tells you that that's using inert gas to provide that same protection like the uh, flux material does, except it's uh, provided by this inert gas supplied as part of the welding process. Acetylene, that's the uh, oxy-fuel welding process we learned about. And that's what supplies the energy for uh, oxy fuel welding uh, as opposed to electricity for the arc welding. Uh, electrode contains a filler metal. And the last one, electricity, the one left, uh, provides energy for plasma arc welding. It also supplies energy for all those arc welding processes, but that was the only one left over for that one. Uh, so in general, those were, some of them were answered better than others. So only half of you got this one. Uh, so I'm not sure these, 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 yeah, maybe these two you some of you flipped on. This was really scored lowly. So the problem with these matching things is if you miss one, you automatically miss two. So. That's a little disconcerting, but anyway, those are the questions, answers to those. We'll keep going uh, unless there's questions. 
uh, match the fusion welding process with description. So oxy-fuel gas welding, those require two separate cylinders. One of them is the fuel gas, and one of them is the oxidizer, which is generally uh, oxygen. Gas tunks and arc welding, that's, uh, that's TIG welding, it uses inert gas for shielding and uses a non-consumable electrode. So multiple of these things use inert gas and multiple use non-consumable electrodes, but only one of them uses both. So this is the best answer for gas tungsten arc welding, which is TIG welding. Uh, shielded metal arc welding, that's stick welding and it uses flux to prevent oxidation. That's those electrodes we learned about where you, uh, it outgasses and, and prevents the oxidation of the weld due to that flux outgassing. Uh, gas metal arc welding uses inert gas for shielding and uses a consumable electrode. This is MIG welding. That's what y'all did in the lab, right? And it uses that inert gas to shield it and that electrode just comes spitting out of the end and so that was gas metal arc welding or MIG welding. Uh, electron beam welding, that was kind of a specialty weld that you required a vacuum environment that none of these other ones need. And plasma arc welding, like the TIG welding, it uses non-consumable electrode but it has two types of gas uh, for plasma arc welding. It has the it has the inert gas for the shielding, the shield around the well, but it also has the plasma gas that gets lit off and gets the high temperatures to make that uh, plasma form. So that was that was that one. All right, you are awful quiet, so I'll just keep going here. <clears throat> uh, all right, here we're looking at our electrode nomenclature, uh, part numbers. And so here's an example part number. And so what do these pieces mean? Well, the 85 is the uh, tensile strength in KSI. So if you have this electrode, you know that the filler material strength, uh, material tensile strength is 85,000 PSI. So that's what that's telling you. The next digit is two. This has to do with the uh, position that you put the weld electrode at, whether it's horizontal or vertical or any position. Second character tells you that. And most of y'all got that, so that's good. Uh, this uh, next character here, this has to do with the current type. And so whether or not it's alternating current or a direct current, or if it's alternating current, it had two options, a plus and a minus. And so that character there tells you uh, current type required. And then the last one, this one is one that's sometimes optional, but if it's there, it gives you indication about some material properties, more detailed information about the alloying uh, elements in the uh, in the filler metal. So those were answered pretty well. So yeah, it was just a matter of reading that slide. And here we're doing our weld call out. So I did this as a matching problem. And so uh, let's go down here. And so let's go look at our uh, standard and remember what, uh, what the uh, callouts mean. And so if you're above the line, it's the other side. If you're below the line, it's the arrow side. And there's two types of welds. There's fillet welds we talked about, and the other two are bevel welds. And so if the symbol's on the top, that means it's the other side. So this is a fillet weld on the left side, of the vertical plate. So this would be, this would be uh, weld number three. And then you just go down and do the same thing. This is also a fillet weld. And since it's on the bottom side, it's going to be the arrow side, so it would be on the right side. So it would be a fillet weld on the right side. And these two are bevel welds, so it's going to be uh, one and two. One's on the right side, one's on the left side. So uh, C is one, which is on 
the right side to the location of the symbol, and then D is the other side, which is it's number uh, call out B, resulting well two is on the left side. And this last one uh, wasn't one of the ones listed, but this was the all around well. And you guys did that on that homework assignment. So most of these were answered pretty high percentages, so that's good. Makes me feel good. All right, uh, continuing on, casting terms. So let's go through these. Riser, riser is that thing that keeps the material from forming those uh, pipes in the uh, cast part. And so risers help prevent defects. The well is right is at the bottom of the uh, sprue, and that's where you get the uh, you're able to capture any contaminants in that molten metal before it goes into the the cavity of the mold. Uh, expendable molds. Expendable mold, we talked about draft angles on those on those uh, permanent molds because you're gonna need to get the part out of the mold. And so if, uh, if you've got expendable mold, you just crack the well, you just crack the, uh, the, uh, the mold open and there's no need to have draft angles. So that was the answer on that one. Permanent mold, we talked about that being a good option for engine blocks because they're, you don't want to be making one mold, of, uh, expendable mold, over and over and over again when you're making thousands and thousands of parts. So that would be a good option for uh, permanent mold, making engine blocks. Uh, shrinkage, shrinkage is most of a concern when you're doing aluminum cast parts because that shrinkage percentage was so high. And so uh, that was in one of those charts we talked about. Some of those cast irons have really small shrinkage values, but aluminum, I think, had the highest of all of them. And then the last one, part removal from mold. Uh, that's just the opposite of the other one, talking about expendable mold, when you don't have to worry about draft angles. If you've got to get the part out of the mold, you've got to have those draft angles on the mold so that the part can actually get out of the, out of the mold. All right, it takes care of those. Uh, brazing, soldering. Okay, so here we go into brazing and soldering. So induction brazing we talked about. Uh, that's when you have that, that video we watched where you have the, the fitting and the, and the pieces being brazed together. And you supply that high current, high frequency to those coiled cable, uh, copper wires. And it creates that high frequency to uh, create the temperature to do the brazing. So wave soldering is another video we watched that was good for circuit card assembly. It looks like most of you got that. So that's good. Uh, capillary action is an important parameter when doing brazing. And we talked about the main impact of being able to have good capillary action or not. It had to do with uh, joint clearance. Furnace brazing, uh, you don't need any oxy fuel torch because you put the parts together, you put the filler material on the part, put it on tray, put it in the furnace, and turn on the heat and it melts that and causes that capillary action. So you don't need a fuel, oxy fuel torch for that kind of brazing. Uh, solder, solder, they had to reformulate based on the uh, Rojas directive because uh, it contained, initially it contained too much lead. So that had to be, they didn't ban solder. They just forced manufacturers to reformulate the uh, material that goes into the solder and then lead didn't get reformulated, they just restricted its use due to the Rojas Directive because the material, that material itself is dangerous. So, so, sure. When it comes to solder, I was a little bit confused. It made sense when it comes to solder, I was a little bit confused. It made but sense that that's the one that had to be like remade with less slide, so I that made sense. But do you have to use like a furnace to solder? Because I thought you did. Like I thought you used a soldering iron. Correct. In other words, which I'm doesn't sure which use like a gas. Uh, solder. 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 
the solder <laughs> one. What I'm asking is, I, I thought very long on this one, mm -hmm. debating if it was what, what I'm basically asking is, I, I thought very long on this uh, one, debating if it was oxy-fuel torch not so like required. Like solder and iron doesn't use and an oxy -fuel. I just want to clarify that solder, like a soldering iron doesn't use an oxy -fuel. Uh A soldering iron, yeah, soldering iron is just soldering iron. It may or may not use... No, no, yeah, you're right. It doesn't use. So you're saying that solder could, you could have answered solder as this one. You could have, but yep. um, when you think about it, it's, they had to remake it. I remember. You could they have, have but um, when I you think that. about yeah, it, it's, but, but you got a good they point. They had to remake it. What I happens that. They is, had to remake the formula. Whoops. I remember that. What happens is some of these could be, you could choose t either one of them. For solder, you could choose oxy fuel torch not required. Right? Yes. And you could, for induction brazing, you could use the same thing. Yes. But look at the other choices, there's no other choice to yes. make. In other words, when, when I get to a question like this where I can get two or three of them that could fit, I just skip it and move on. And then at the end, there should only be one left. But you're exact, exactly right. This, this, this answer here could have gone... To most of these things. Yeah, it made the most sense, but I was just wanting to clarify to make sure I understood what. Yeah, soccer. yeah, yeah it your, made your the most sense, correct, but I was just wanting talking, to clarify to make sure I understood you can what. Use, normally, works. you don't use an oxy fuel gas. I guess you could, but the most of the time, when the vast majority of soldering is done with a soldering iron, and now that I'm thinking about it, I mean, I, I guess you could use a torch, but the whole reason to use soldering instead of brazing is that you can get it's the temperature doesn't have to be that hot and so uh so i'm not going to say that there is no i don't know of any process that uses an oxy fuel torch for soldering but there, there might be i don't know but you're, you. you're yeah you bet all right good question all right so that okay. takes us through those what's the next one here manufacturing processes so deep drawing that's the one that uh, you make the beverage cans out of, and you start with a blank. We saw in the in the uh, we didn't see a video, but we saw on the slide. So that was starts with a blank. Punching is where you do the uh, you have the punch to punch the piece out, but with punching you keep the part and throw away the part that got punched away, and so that was the perforated panel. Uh, grain direction is the thing we talked about when you're doing sheet metal bending. Manufacturing engineer has to keep track of which way the grain direction is because if you bend it across that grain, you're going to potentially get some cracking. So that was the answer on that one. Uh, air bending. This one was kind of tricky, and I can see the response is not great. Air bending and deep drawing and punching and spin forming, they all maintain service to volume ratio. So what does that even mean? What does maintain surface to volume ratio? What does that mean? Somebody talk to me. If you're doing extrusion, we're going to talk about extrusions, uh, the next set of topics. When you do extrude, you're shoving material through a die and you're increasing the surface area and keeping the volume the same. So let's, let's do an easier type. What happens to the surface to volume ratio? Uh, that's not a good example. So surface to volume ratio just means you take the surface area and you divide it by the volume. So if I got a piece of sheet metal, where's my sheet metal part? Mm, here it is. So think about a sheet metal part. Get my camera going here. So here's my sheet metal part. If I start this thing flat, with a flat pattern, like you guys know how to do, and I measure the surface area, and then I measure the volume of the material that I start with, and then I bend it up, how did, what is the change in the volume? How does the volume change before and after that process? 
It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't change. But these parts we're machining, we machine these parts. We start off with a full block, and it's got some volume. And at the end, we got chips on the floor, and we've got less volume. And so, for a machine part, the surf the volume changes. On a sheet metal part, the surface area stays basically the same, and the volume stays the same because there's no material moving. And air bending is a is a type of sheet metal bending, and so that's why that was the best answer for that one. If you start changing, we start learning about forging and processes that are actually moving the material around. If you start with a big chunk of material and smash it flat, the surface area is going to go way up. Say I have a billet of material. We're going to learn about this in the next set of slides. A big chunk of material, and I hit it with a forge, and I pound it down, pound it down until it's a half inch thick, and it's this gigantic piece this big, this way. Well, the volume, how does the volume on that change? Well, and it doesn't change. There's no material coming off. It's just reshaping it. But the surface area goes way up. And so the idea is that, yeah, for these forging operations, the surface to volume ratio goes way up. But for air bending or any sheet metal bending, the, uh, the surface to volume ratio stays the same. All right, press brake is that hydraulic machine we saw the videos on and saw the schematics on. That, uh, that's what provides the power to do that, that uh, bending. And so that's the energy provided when you plastically deform raw material, that's what we're doing here. We're plastically deforming the sheet because it's a permanent, it's a permanent uh, deformation. So by definition, that's a plastic deformation. And then spin forming was the one we saw where that thing spun up, had the uh, mandrel, and had that tool on the outside. And uh, those parts have to be rotationally symmetric because the thing is spinning, it's just making one, one shape. So like those bells for a trumpet we talked about, that would be a good candidate for making uh, the uh, spin forming process. All right, we're getting towards the end here, the first half, the first part. Uh, these are all adhesive bonding processes. So epoxies, uh, we talked about those are generally the two-part epoxies. You have a part A and a part B, you mix them together, as soon as you mix them together, it starts curing up. So that was uh, the answer for epoxy. Uh, cyano, I should get Dr. Londo over here. She would know how to pronounce this. Cyanoacrylate, that was that was super glue, right? And so, where's my super glue? I thought I had brought that in. I don't think I still left it home. So that was uh, super glue. So any commonly used is high strength, all-purpose bonding adhesive. Uh, anaerobic, that was our thread locker, and it cures under the absence of oxygen. So most of you got that right, which is good. Curing time determines when that joint achieves its full strength. So if it's got a 10-minute curing time, you got to clamp it together and hold it together until 10 minutes is up before you get the full strength. Some of these, some of these have you know maybe a day and a half curing time, where you have to keep them clamped together during that time to make sure that it he's adhesive fully cures to get that final joint strength. So most of you got that. Peel strength is one of those parameters that doesn't show up on isotropic materials because they have the same strength in all directions. These adhesives, you gotta worry about things like shear strength and peel strength uh, because they're not isotropic. And then the last one, polyurethane, uh, that was the only one left over, I guess. But that's a good choice for high impact resistance. And that was on that same table. So if you're able to look at that table, you should have got all those right. Uh, and then, well, we're still not to the end yet. I guess this is the last one. So this is Rojas compliant or not. So 95.5% tin solder, that means they've taken out most all the lead. So that's going to be compliant. 60 40 tin lead solder, that's when they used to make it in the old days where they had, I forget which is which, but I think 60% tin, 40% lead, that's way too much lead. And so that's no longer, or that's not Rojas compliant. Uh, any kind of paint you buy from Home Depot is not gonna have any lead in it. So that's Rojas compliant. Uh, anodizing, this is a process I've used more times than I'd like to admit. When I worked in the 
aerospace industry, using hexavalent chromium on anodizing aluminum makes a really, really nice anodized surface. And it works really, really well, except it kills all the fish. And so that's one of the materials that they made non Rojas compliant because of that problem. Uh, this one I thought was an interesting one. So most of you got this right, but wave soldering process in Malaysia used in motherboards delivered to Spain. Well, I don't care if it's made in Malaysia or Vietnam or, or Austin, Texas. If you're making printed circuit boards that are being delivered to Spain, Spain is in Europe. They're part of the European Union. And if you're making parts to be sold and delivered to Spain, it's going to have to be Rojas compliant. So that was a Rojas compliant one. And the last one, anything with liquid mercury in it, it's not going to be compliant because of the mercury. And so that was non-compliant. All right. So I'm going to keep going unless there's questions. Uh, so now we're in this computational problem. So these were all exactly the same picture. It's the same problem. We've got a K factor. We've got a thickness. We've got a design rule that says the inside bin radius is one and a half times the material thickness. So this is really the same problem. The only difference is this angle over here, instead of being a 90 degree bend, it's a 45 degree bend. And the way it's defined in the definition, and that's why I wrote this down here, is the A value for this bend here is 45. And so I asked for these particular values, little t on down the line. So let me go, uh, go switch over to the spreadsheet. It has more details about uh, the answers to these questions. So let's get down here. How can I do this? Let's go view. Maybe a little smaller. So here are the answers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so this is the column with the points. And so I got all three times eight. I got all of mine right. So these are the answers. Here's another summary of the answers down or the, or the problem down here. So thickness was 332nd, inside bend radius is one and a half times that, so that should have been your inside bend radius. K factor, and we've got to keep track of, we had two different bends, so we're going to have two different bend allowances, two different outside setbacks, two different bend deductions, and then that final flat pattern length is going to be A plus B plus C, all three of those legs, and we've got to subtract two bend deductions, but they're two different bends, and so one of the bend deductions is this one, one of the bend deductions is this one. So find your name on here and go across here, and you can see which ones you got right, which ones you got wrong. So I'll leave that up for another 60 seconds so you can see what you, uh, what you entered. Yeah, so that, for example, this one here, this person, that's the number they put in. And that's the number of points they got. This person put in that number, got zero points. Does that make sense? So it's it's your answer and then the points, your answer, the points, your answer, the points. So the, this first one was the, was the little t value, and some of y'all got spun up about it, but... It's just the definition of the K factor. So if we go back to homework, whatever it was, homework, uh, where is it? Mm, homework, sheet metal, this thing here. Yeah, where is it? So it's the same, this same PDF file that we used on the homework. We did this homework twice. So I know y'all are familiar with this. So when we talked about K factor, we defined the K factor based on big T and little t. So there's little t and there's big T. So I gave you big T. And you said to reverse calculate little t. That was the first question. And then, uh, oops. Uh, and then the next one was... Uh, 
these bend allowances and outside setbacks. So let me leave that there for another 30 seconds. And entertain any questions you have. So if you've if you got outside setback wrong, you're gonna automatically miss the bend deduction. So I sent out some instructions. I heard from some of you and I've already answered your emails. So I want to continue to take emails uh, uh, just just until the end of class. And so once the end of class comes by, I'm gonna finalize all these adjustments and then make these grades final. So if you got a request and you send me an email on Friday, I can't help you because I need it. I need it. I needed it before class started, but I'll accept them through the end of class. And don't send me an email saying, hey, I think I earned extra credit. Send me an email with specific questions about what you did on your hand calculations and uh, why you think you deserved uh, extra credit, because that's why I have you turn those in. And if you didn't turn in hand calculations, then I, I can't help you. <clears throat> All right, well. I'll assume everybody's happy with that. So what I'll do is uh, I'll go through and finish looking at these requests and I'll do a grade summary. I'll do a grade analysis like I did before. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna add points to the raw scores that are on Canvas now based on that analysis of the questions. So some of them, some of the questions have pretty low uh, correct answers supplied so those I'll have to add points in to make it whole that's what I call it making it whole so that uh, I correct any uh, issues with problem statements or confusions by the problem the way it was worded anything like that so I'll do that as soon as I as soon as class is over I want to finish doing that and I'll post a little note that on canvas to tell you what those added points are and then that'll close out exam two and we'll move on your hand calculations? I put Where them on canvas until about 10 minutes ago when I replaced it with this slide here. So I already sent you an email, but there was a question in the chat. Oh, okay. I already yeah. sent you an email, uh, but there it was, was on a canvas question in the chat since about where it was. was over. So if you missed it, then okay. you can pop into to, to, uh, office hours and we can talk about it as always. Post the lecture slides for today. Another yes, I can. Can you yes, post I can. the lecture slides uh, for today? The new material. Hopefully, we'll just get started on them. It's already one o'clock. Uh. Okay, so let's talk about lab five. Well, first of all, I want to talk about lab. Uh, the lab yesterday. Half of y'all went to the lab yesterday. So, who wants to tell me about? How that went? The CNC demo lab. Great, I thought. So, did y'all work? What machine did y'all go to? Did y'all go to the three-axis or the five-axis? We used both, I believe. We used the five-axis for the mill, both, and then we believe. used the lathe. We used that's the five-axis right. for the did mill, a and then lathe we used part. the lathe. So that's the first time you've seen a turned part. So that's good. That that five-axis machine. Did he make a part that? that required it to rotate around? No. What kind of part, do you remember what kind of part he made? No. He remade the same part that remade we made this on the thing? manual Okay, so let's talk about yeah, We that. just remade the uh, same part that we made on the manual mill. That yeah. five axis machine yeah. can make this part, but you can also make this on the three axis CNC machine. And the three axis CNC machine is right next to that. You go, you pass it when you go to the five axis. And that and that, that five axis is really cool, but when you're making parts like this, you can make it on both. And so if you if the three axis machine is down, you can make it into five axis machine. But if you've got some kind of a curvy part like we watched in that video, with that ball in joint, that ball in uh, end mill, where it had that curved surface, that thing was rotating around. That can only be made in a five axis uh, CNC milling machine. Uh, so, but that, that three axis is just like the manual machine, except it's just computer numerically controlled. It'll move this way. Well, I say it's exactly the same. 
It's actually different. You can move in, in X direction, you can move in Y direction. But anybody remember the difference between the manual machine that we learned the first half of the semester and the CNC three axis? What about those X and Y movements? What's the difference between those two machines? The CNC also has rotation on each axis? No, no, the, the five axis allows those two extra axes axis. of rotation. The three axis Miller machine can just move this way and this way. But the difference is on the CNC three axis, it can move in X and Y at the same time. Remember when you made, we made this part, we just went one direction and then we shifted gears and went another direction. We only went one direction at a time. On the three axis CNC machine, you can move in two directions at the same time. You can cut material while moving the machine in two directions because it's computer numerically controlled. And so you'll learn more about that, you manufacturing engineers that take uh, 3316 CAD CAM you'll use that three axis machine and see that difference. Uh, but I'm glad you got to see that, that demo, that's good. And that turning, uh, that's how you make these parts that look like this. Get my camera up here. These are these turned parts. And so this thing is just screaming out to make it on a lathe because I can chuck the part up like you guys saw yesterday that went yesterday. Chuck it up and get that tool on there. And the the work piece is spinning and the tool just stays and moves down the line there and does those cuts this way so this is a turned part and this is a milled part and you got to see both of those in operation yesterday so that's good so you folks that are signed up to go next week will have that to look forward to uh Okay, so that's good news that the lab went good. And so that'll just be an attendance thing. If you showed up, you'll, on time, you'll get a hundred for that. All right, let's talk about the welding lab. So I'm gonna add on another assignment to cap off the welding lab. And I'm gonna turn on my camera here. See if I can do this. So Henry went and took your welding uh, welding uh, tinsel specimens that y'all welded back a couple, three weeks ago. <clears throat> and he put them, so each team, each group of teams picked uh, what they thought was the best uh, weld sample from the day. And you guys sheared them off to that specimen. And so he's taken those five uh, submittals, and he's done a tensile test on them. He's put him in that MTS tensile test machine that we learned about with homework three when we did that tensile test. You made those stress strain curves. We're going to do that all over again one more time. And so they put him in there. They put the gripper on there, and they gripped onto that specimen, and they pulled on it until it broke, just like they did, just like we did on the other side. So somebody from each team is going to need to come by and pick up your specimen because you're going to need to measure the geometry of the part in order to do these calculations. And so here's a bag of here's a bag of goodies. I got all five of them in here, and so I'll have these sitting outside my office or in my office here. So somebody from the team I need one person to come by and pick them up. So let's pop this thing open and see what this thing looks like. So the instructions for doing lab, I'm calling it lab five. I think that's the right number. This is the instructions now. So you need to get out pencil and paper and write this down because I'm not going to give you a hand that I'm going to just describe it here as we're talking. So I'm pulling this thing open here. And so here's a test specimen here, here. Sure. This goes for uh, the uh, um, online Summers, real quick uh, labs as well. This goes for uh, the non-physical uh, labs. Yeah, as well. yeah. Online. You're going to yeah, labs as well. Uh, the the online labs, labs well. are going. The folks that are excuse me, the folks that are remote. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. The remote lab bunch. You're going to have your own set of data. 
Yeah. And yeah, you're not going to be able to come pick up these specimens. So you're going to have to ask me to measure. They, me they did some extra samples. And so you'll have to send me an email and ask me what measurements you want me to make on your test specimen. And I'll send it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Uh, does it have to be everyone? Okay. No, no. This is it's a good question. If you, uh, I, I definitely everyone, don't want everybody to ask me. Lab so here's a very, lab. very important <laughs> rule. If you send me any correspondence whatsoever for this lab five, this welding tinsel test lab, if you send me an email and do not copy your team members, well, first thing, my head is going to explode. <laughs> Number two, I'm just going to put you on a different team with other people that refuse to copy their team members. So the first thing you should do is get together with your team members, send out a group email and say, hey, what's the first thing you're gonna talk about? Eric? Uh, who's gonna pick up this specimen? <laughs> we gotta figure out who's gonna pick that up. We gotta get that thing from Summers. If you're yeah. on a remote team, then the question is gonna be, who is gonna send Summers an email to ask him to do the measurements we need, right? Because I want one email from the team asking me these questions. And I'm, uh, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, if you send me an email and don't copy your team members, team, right? I'm just going to put you on uh, a separate okay. team with another person that does the same thing. These team labs, they're team labs for a reason. And I want you all to get, and I think it's working pretty okay. good. These teams, you guys are gelling together and you're working good as a team. And so that's what I want you to be able to do as you move into these other classes because 3316, all these junior and senior level classes, they have team projects just on a regular basis. And if you get students going in there that's never done it before, it ends up badly because everybody's pointing the finger at somebody else and then nothing gets done. So. Uh, uh, real quick, how soon do you want these, these emails? Because I can do it now. Just a, you can do it like, whenever you want to uh, do it. This quick, thing is due next these, Tuesday. These emails? Because I can do it now. Just a, okay. Just okay. Good. And copy your team members so I don't, yeah. I don't want my head to explode. Okay, I'll just do it now. <laughs> cool. Okay. All right. So, yeah. good questions. So. So okay. somebody, somebody comment about this well test here. What do you think? Break on the weld. Is that good or bad? It didn't break on the weld. Uh, I'd say good, but it's my weld, so it might be biased. Oh no, no, this, is, uh, this has nothing to I'd do say with good, how you feel. But it's my it. weld, so it might I be say, biased. I say, well, I felt good about my weld. Well, you know, if the thing breaks, I don't really care how you feel. But you're right. That's what we talked about, right? The weld joint should be stronger than the base metal. So where did this thing break? Well, it's obvious. It broke down here at the bottom. It didn't break at the weld, so this is a good thing. Now, what might have caused it to break down here as opposed to up at the top? This weld is really, see it's really full, goes all the way across. And so who was talking, who's welder, who's, who's, who did this weld? Cole. Cole, have you done welding before? One time. Okay, so you've Cole. done it twice as much as most people in the class. So, uh, so this, this is good. This, and some of y'all's welds are going to broke, you know, way early. And so that's not preferred, but I'm not turning you into welders. I'm turning you into manufacturing and industrial engineers. And so uh, you're going to have somebody expert welder doing this welding but you need to know what to look for and this is a good thing and so some of these look like this some of them don't all right so let's go back through the through the uh notes over here so welding team lab it's due next tuesday uh tinsel specimen you got to come get them from me or you got to send me an email from your team to ask me to take some measurements uh henry details so henry sent me an email and he did a great job as usual on these things. And so let me find his email. Mm, where is Henry's email? All right, here's what he sent me. Attached to the tensile test results. So these tensile test results, I posted these in Canvas. And they're now sitting there waiting for your... Uh, to go get them and so they're under files 
Uh, labs, lab five. So here they are. These are CSV files, comma, separated uh, files you can open up in Excel. And so just find your team and that's your data. And we'll open up one here to see what it looks like. Right, this is the data that came from the real tensile test they did. And that doesn't look too exciting, does it? So let me open them up in Excel. Mm. Labs. Mm. Here. Here we go. Let's right, see if this works. All right, so what is this? This is some header information. All right, here we go. Here's the data. Why is this thing misbehaving? Just hide that. All right, so what am I looking at here? Actuator millimeters load KN time seconds. So what is this? What's this first column telling me? This is, this is measuring, all, all that machine does is clamp onto that thing and it starts pulling with more and more force. And so, it's, go ahead. What does actuator mean? That's what I'm asking, yeah. What do those numbers mean? What, the, what does actuator mean? I don't think mean? we've been told what that is. Well, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. I want you to well, figure I, this out. We don't, you do I don't a think we've been told what that is. Lang, they're giving lengths, that's the units, but... It's, it's, yeah, it's the units they're are in length, length, but what does that number length, mean? They're giving length, that's the units, but... They're giving length. The deformation? That's the deformation. And so when it's, when the load like was... Deformation? 6, 0.657 kilonewtons, it had moved 0. 0.004 millimeters total. And then when it moved, when he had 9.66407 kilonewtons on it, it had moved that much millimeters. And then what, are this, what is this time? What is this talking about? Well, you can only imagine that these all happened at the same time. So after they turned on the test and it started pulling, after 188 milliseconds, the load was at this much, and that's how much it had deflected from the beginning. So these are total deflections from the start, and these are total forces at these starts here. So this, this data is presented differently, I'm sure, than what we did in homework three, but you should be able to look at this stuff and say, okay, this is a tensile test? Okay, I get it. This has to be that deflection value, and this has to be the load at those deflection values, and this is the time. And for what we're dealing with, we don't care about the time because we're just looking, you're looking to make a stress-strain curve. So you're going to convert this data into stress and strain and plot one of those stress-strain curves, just like we did in homework three. And let's go back to my little sheet here. And so, yeah, what did Henry say? Attached to the tensile test, Sabash, that's another graduate student that actually ran the test and Henry coordinated with him. He was very helpful. This is nice. This is letting Sabash know. Sabash is not supposed to help me. Henry is the one that's hired to help me, but his buddy helped us out. So he thanked him, which is nice. And he copied Dr. Tate, which is nice. He lets Tate know, hey, Summers asked us to do this and we did it and now we're done with it. And so this is a great email. Uh, he's got a nice subject line here. He's copied the right people. So this is good. Uh, what else did he say? Grip separation was kept at 27.4 millimeters for all five tests. Grip separation. What does that mean? The distance between the two grips on the specimen. 
Yeah. The so distance between what's the, two the grips what's on the gauge the length specimen of this test specimen? How do I measure that? Remember, you need to know the grip length, the original length. How do you how would I measure that on this broken test specimen? It's a trick question. How do I measure it? I can't measure it. The grip length was the length that it started at before I started pulling on it. Well, this damn thing has been elongated because it's been through this tensile test. And so Henry is telling us, hey, just like I'm not sure who was answering the question, but you answered it correctly. The grip separation is just the distance between those grippers, when you clamp onto it and grip onto it, the distance between those grips, that's the gauge length. That's the starting length of this thing. And when you pull on it, when I grab this thing right here, see the, see the little things on there? That's from that gripper squeezing so tight, it crushed it. You see that? And so the distance between these grip marks and these grip marks on this other piece before he started pulling on it how far were those apart well it tells us right there in the email so write that down 27.4 millimeters so that tells you what it started off as and then what's the final length well you're going to have to whoever this is you're going to have to piece this thing back together like it was right before it broke and then measure what the final length is. And that's going to be, that's going to, you can calculate the strain at failure, right? It's this length divided by that original length. That's the definition of strain, right? Sure. Is it the, fi is it the final length of the piece or is it the final length of the grip? Professor, well, you tell is, me, it the is it the final length this, of the piece much, or is it the final length of the grip between the grip? How much deflection was there in this piece the top? How much did that deflect in this range right here? when I pulled on it. Somebody help us out. How far did it deflect down here at the bottom? Clamped onto this thing like a madman on that machine. How much does this deflect at the bottom? Not very much, if at all. Yeah, it's going to be none because I'm holding on to it right here. Not very much. The machine much, is holding on here and not letting it spread apart. All the elongation is happening between these two edges. So that's where all the deflection is. That's the final length. And the original length, I can't measure it on this thing because it's already stretched apart. This thing is all neck down here. I have no idea by looking at it, but Henry was smart enough to know that you guys would need that information. So that's why he told you what he told you in this email. Measurement in the Excel file plus the original length there. Could we not just use well, the, uh, that's a the, good question. The measurement you have to think in about the Excel what file mean. plus the original so length that's there. Excellent question. Let's go back to the spreadsheet, wherever it went. So what's the what's the one what's the set of data that is missing from this chart here? At time zero, how much load was on this thing? Zero. It's, when it starts off, it's zero force, just sitting there. It's clamping it zero. like crazy. Time is zero. The load is zero. And how much has it deflected? Zero. zero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nothing's happened yet. And so this isn't... Zero. <laughs> the change in length at this force is this number minus this number. Go back and you need to go back and revisit homework three because this is going to do it exactly, exactly the same way. So I, I don't remember who was asking that first question, but I think that I think somebody made a comment that are these the are these the values we plug? In? No, the, these are the deflections at that load at that time. So if you want to know how far it's deflected since you started the test, it's going to be this number minus zero. It's going to be the deflection. And the load is going to be one and a half kilonewtons. And at what load did it break? I don't know. I'm going to go to the bottom of the thing and see when it broke. 
And so it, when you plot it, it's going to have that same telltale curve. It's going to have a maximum stress, and you'll see where it breaks. Let's go see what that looks like here at the bottom. What I was asking was is, is if we could take the length at the, at the point where it broke. Right, so I guess what I was asking yeah, was is, is if we could take the like length at the, at the point where it broke and just add that to the Okay, I think I see what you're saying. So if you take those two numbers, wouldn't that give us what you measure the final length. Let's go back to the camera. I think you're, I think you're on to the game. And so it's going to be kind of tricky, but if you put this thing back together like it was and measure between those two grip attach points, that number should match this last number in the chart, right? Because right here, the data quit coming out. That last number in the chart plus the original length. Mm, right, that yes. last number in the chart plus yes. the original length. I don't know who's talking, Eric. The 27.4. Yeah, that's length. exactly right. This is how far it deflected. Well, that's not going back to the camera. Glad I got this camera. So, yeah, this distance from here to here is not that number because this is... This includes that original, whatever it was, 27.4 or whatever that email said. So what you said is exactly right. And what you're going to, and, and that'll be a way to check to make sure the numbers match up. And it won't match up perfect because it's really hard to get this thing back like it was. But yeah, what you said is exactly right. That's why I was wondering is, is, is which would be more accurate, adding those two numbers together or taking an actual measurement? Yeah, I guess that's why I was wondering is, is, I think is taking, which would be more a, accurate, adding question. those two numbers together I think or taking measuring an measurement piece of the broken is just piece. to check to make sure that you haven't screwed something up. The data is going to be the data is going to be the data. But but and, and what can happen? So let's continue on that on that thread. What can happen is when you first start pulling on this thing, a lot of times at the beginning it'll kind of start settling in. You might get some movement and it's just the grip, this, this crazy grip uh, thing is just kind of settling in and it's kind of, it's kind of moving a little bit without doing any deformation at all. And so you might find that your stress strain curve has a, has a offset at the beginning. And so maybe what you do is you, you know, you maybe you maybe have to eliminate a few of the first rows of numbers. So I want to say, just just assume these numbers are great or perfect. Do your stress strain curve, and then measure the actual test specimen and see if it doesn't match pretty close. It should match pretty close, but I haven't checked these numbers yet, so I'd be interesting to know. And if there's a discrepancy, what are you going to do? You're going to get on some engineering computation paper, and you're going to make a report. For the, the team is going to do a report and say, and, and I'm going to talk about what needs to go on the report, but you, you can talk about that at the end. I want you to put some words in there to say, hey, the, you know, the, we measured this test specimen. It seemed to match the data pretty close. Or you might say, yeah, it didn't seem to match very well. Maybe this thing was slipping. Maybe the grip was slipping at the beginning of the test. And so I want you to look at the test results with a little skepticism and see if you, if you find something that looks odd, then just pop into to office hours and we'll, we'll talk about it because I haven't looked at the data yet that closely, but you might find some weirdness in this data. And I suspect one or more of these tests might not have got run correctly. And maybe, you know, we need to talk about it. So it's not just about plugging and chugging and getting an answer and being done with it. I want y'all to scrutinize the data, scrutinize, stress strain curve and if something looks weird it probably is weird and, and we just need to talk about it during office hours or you can bring it up during class we'll, we'll we'll talk about it in front of the whole class so those are really good questions so good job eric so but yeah if you add this total length when you measure it on the real part should be equal to that number from henry plus that last number in this deflection column Time? The length of this thing here that you measure, Professor, that's the you final length time? when it's pieced back together. That length is going to be equal to the 
length that Henry told you this thing started off at, it started off at 27.4 millimeters. So 27.4 millimeters plus however far this thing deflected based on this spreadsheet, the last number in this column here, those two added together should be equal to that measured final length of this thing after it's broken. So you're going to want to draw a picture on engineering computation paper, label final length, label all that stuff so it's clear in your head. Because uh, me saying it is not going to do it. You need to draw a picture, label the parameters, and then figure out how they match up with these numbers here. All right, so let me keep going through my sheet here. So Henry did, okay, so this is the material. This is what uh, uh, Ruben Villarreal, Mr. Villarreal told me that the material is made out of. So you need to look that up and figure out what the, what the material properties are that you need to use to do these calculations. Uh, you're going to use that CSV file, and you're going to create a stress strain curve, just like you did on homework three. And you're going to calculate, you're going to pull extract from that the stress at failure. Excuse me, not stress at failure. Uh, ultimate stress. Right, that's the peak of the curve, right? Like we did before, that's ultimate strength, ultimate tensile strength. And I want you to report it on your hand calculations that you're going to turn in as a team. You should report it in megapascals and PSI both. And then I want some conversation about the failure mode. How did it fail? Did it fail at the weld? Did it fail, you know, not at the weld? Give me some conversation about that. And then the last thing is I want to know what your weld performance was. So let's see how to calculate that. So what you're going to do is if there was no weld here and you just had a blank piece of material the same size and you pulled on it and got the ultimate strength of that piece of material, you can calculate that. How do you calculate that? Well, you do your stress strain curve and just find that maximum point up there. And so how would you calculate what that ultimate stress would be for just the material by itself? Well, you got to go find the standard. You got to go find AISI 10 standard. And let's just write it up and see what it looks like. All right. So AISI, what is it, 1018? Yeah, 1018 steel. So what's the ultimate tensile strength of that? I don't know what it is, but just to say, I'll make up a number. Say it's 50,000 PSI. So just a bare piece of 1018 steel, pretend it's 50,000 PSI ultimate strength. Well, if I've got a tensile specimen, that I pull on with no weld, I can calculate what the stress is. It's F over A, right? Normal stress is force over area. Well, I can solve for force. Force is equal to stress times area. I can calculate the force I would expect that I need to break this thing. And that force would be 50,000 PSI times the area of this tensile specimen. And if I look at the end of this tensile specimen, it looks like this. So you're going to measure the width of your tensile specimen, and you're going to measure the thickness. You're going to multiply those two together, and that's going to be the area. You multiply that times whatever the tensile strength of the material is, and you're going to get a force. 
And that would be the force that it takes to break a piece of material that's no weld, it's just the material. Now you're going to go compare that number with the force or the stress that it saw during the test specimen, during the tensile test. And so if you if your if your your test data says that it failed at 50,000 psi, I want to call that a 100% weld. That means the weld was exactly equal to the strength of the material. So that's what I'm talking about here when I say, I want you to tell me what the weld performance is. If it's 100%, that means the weld was exactly the same strength as the base material. If the weld failed first, then you're going to get a number that's less than 100%. You're going to divide these numbers by one another, compare those two numbers, and then tell me how strong the weld was compared to the base material. And so this weld specimen we're looking at right here, is that going to be more or less than 100%? That's right. So if the material fails first, I so give the well performance something over 100%, and it's just a ratio of those two numbers. If you look at yours and it, and it broke right at the weld, then that means that tensile, that, that, that tensile strength is going to be less than the material, and that's what your data is going to show. And you take the same ratio, and they get a number less than 100%. And then add some comments to talk about what you think about it, what you learned, what you didn't learn. So it's going to be a free form report on engineering computation paper. And you're going to, just like you did on homework three, I don't want to see your spreadsheet. I don't want to see your chart. What I want you to do is do a nice Excel plot of your stress strain curve and cut it, print it out and cut it out and tape it to a piece of engineering computation paper and include that on your thing you submit for your team. This might be a stupid question. No, but, no, um, no. You know, you know how the uh, the pieces clamp um, on the two sides? This might be mm -hmm. a stupid question. Um, but, um, we have you, to, know, you know how the, the, uh, the pieces the clamp on two sides? Right? sides. Um, so would the area, we have to so just <coughs> deduct just the, the area that's, that the clamp portions? From both sides. So it's the, area. it's the original so the, area. Just the area that's, that is exposed so in order for the... We'll go back to this picture here. Of the are you going to measure it, the width okay. up here? Or are you going to measure it down here? It broke. Is the width the same at the top and the bottom? I would assume it would... Uh, well, it started off being the same, but this looks like it squeezed uh, down I, here. I would assume it would... Yeah. See how this narrow we're looking? And so, you know, maybe they didn't cut it very straight. I don't know. And so there's going to be yeah. some errors in your calculations. But the, the stress area is going to be the original area, which is going to be, I would measure it, I would measure it down here at the very bottom. Because this grip part where it's being gripped onto, that area should be the same before and after because there's no deflection. Because yeah. grip, is, grip is kind of holding it together, right? And so I would measure the area at the bottom. Yeah. And I would measure it at the top. Yeah. And then maybe take an average. Because it looks like this thing isn't cut very straight. Yeah. Or maybe my eyes are, does this look narrower okay. down here than at the top? No, it does. It might yeah. have just been like um, deformation from the grip. It might have been, but I, I don't think it was cut straight. No, it does. It might have just been like um, deformation from the Because it's just hanging on to it. Like if you grab a rubber band on both ends and on pull the, on it, it's yeah. going to get narrower everywhere in the middle, but at the ends yeah. where you're holding it, there's really no load there. Yeah. Uh, so I think this thing was crooked to start with. I think Henry cut this thing crooked. Yeah. Or you cut yeah. crooked or something. I guess that's just why I was asking, just because the pieces or the parts that are being yeah. held, they aren't really... I guess that's just why I was this asking. Is, this is, this is, welcome to the real world. The parts this, that are being held, they're yes. really being 
you um, know, you can subject, you can spend a lot of time doing a test and get a bunch of computer printouts with yeah. eight decimal places of accuracy. But if you have a test specimen that's crooked, then you know, garbage in, garbage out. So I would to make up for that, I would measure the area at the bottom, measure the area at the top, and then take the average. You bet. Okay. Cool. All yeah. right. So it looks like I've used the whole runway here for our exam, which is good. I want to make sure I go over those questions because that's my last time I can go over those with you. So uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll wait until uh, Monday to talk about the next topic. So unless there's more questions, we'll call it a day. And uh, I'll finish those grades on the exam, and then we'll we'll jump into that next lecture slide. I'll put those on Canvas here so you can see them before we have class on Monday. So unless you got more questions, we'll call it a day. What does this do again? We'll read the instructions. Thanks. What does this do again? Uh, will you uh, upload a uh, like yeah. a yeah. Thanks. cell file so that we can type in all of these? Uh, will you uh, the, those, upload those, uh, uh, like a those Excel files Excel that files I opened up? They're all on Canvas already. Values. values. Is that what you're asking? I'm trying to look for them, but uh, unless they have like a weird name. Well, they may have a weird name. So go to Files. Uh, labs. I'm trying to look for them, but uh, unless they have like a weird name. Yeah, I just see a whole bunch of uh, files for. Just a whole bunch of charts coming with. Uh, yeah, I just see a whole bunch of. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's the data. Or, or I guess I was just asking with, if uh, we're gonna have um, like a guy separate Excel file, but they're like all just oh, this how is all these some strings. Or I guess I was just asking. Uh, if, uh, I would I would do just like you did homework three, where some of y'all just made a new tab. Let me go back to Excel here. Just a minute. where did Excel go? So when you open up this uh, data in Canvas, you're going to get this. And so I would just come over here and say, uh, make your, you know, leave, leave this data just like it is. And then add columns okay. on here to convert these millimeters to inches and kilonewtons to pounds and get it into stress and strain in both units. Plot the data and then do the chart. You can do it all right here. Just leave this stuff like it is. And again, I don't want to, don't, don't email me your spreadsheet. I want y'all to do that. You're going to have to do that. But okay. get the chart, get the stress strain curve, print it out, cut it out, and tape it to a piece of engineering computation paper and turn that all in with all the other stuff. So when you say, if I'm going to send you another spreadsheet, the answer is no. You're going to get this data and you just turn this into your own okay. spreadsheet. And the team, you know, not one person is not going to do the whole okay. thing. So... Somebody ought to be in charge of getting this specimen. Somebody, uh, you know, is going to do the spreadsheet. Maybe somebody does the chart. I want you all to work together as a team. And part of the grade, after we turn this thing in, I want to ask every team member, what percentage of the work did every team member do? And if there's four people on the team and everybody says everybody did 25% of the work, then that's going to be good. If somebody says, hey, two people did all the work, these two people did nothing, and I get the same report from the whole team. Then I want to, I want to, I want to adjust the grades accordingly. So that's going to be a separate thing. That's not something I share. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell Joe, hey, Steve said you didn't do any work. I'm just going to take those anonymously. Uh, so the, divide the work up. That's again part of the, part of the thing. And if one of your team members is sick for the next week, okay, then maybe they won't be able to do much work. But maybe on the next lab, y'all do. As a team, you know that person. I'd say, hey, you didn't do the last one. You're gonna you're gonna do this work on this one. So just work as a team uh, as best you can. Uh, do you mind going back to the uh, yeah the one little note page that you had? Yep. The, uh... Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you mind going back to the uh, the one little note page that you had? For this is, this is lab, pretty. Right? This is the instructions for lab. This is lab five. I don't know what the number is. Okay, that's all. That's for lab five. So right? yeah, do a screenshot or write that down. I'm not going to post that. I want I want y'all to, because when when you when you work okay. for somebody, they're not going to give you 
a pre-printed report and say, fill out these numbers. Because if that's all they needed to do, then they'd hire a, you know, a high school kid that can do that. They're going to say, hey, we ran this test. Go, go tell me what the weld looks like. So this is this is the instruction. Lab five. Okay. Cool. If, if I'm missing something okay. or you don't understand something, then just stop by during office hours and we'll chat about it. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, that's all. That's all right, all. Eric. Good to see you. All right. Well, you have a good one. You too. Okay. Good deal. All right. Well, that's all. That's all. Questions. All right. All right. Well, you have a good one.